Well, first of all, a very big welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming along. And uh, an enormous thanks to our panel, who are not only extremely international, but uh, two of them have come from abroad, especially to take part in this event. Uh, one of them is, has come from Paris, from indeed from the depths of UNESCO, which is the organization that has declared February the 13th as uh, World Radio Day. And the other member of the panel who's come from abroad has come from Denmark, and I will introduce them one by one. But we are here to celebrate World Radio Day, and we are celebrating it with this event, which is World Radio Day London, New Perspectives on Traditional Radio. We have a, a very exciting number of uh, topics that we're going to be talking about today, informally, and after uh, our seven presentations, we'll have an opportunity, we hope, for questions and answers, but I would ask you to keep those questions until we have um, presented our, our various topics. So I will introduce briefly each, um, each presenter, and then and I will end with the one who is about to come up and talk. So second up, we will have uh, a presentation from Birgit Jalov, who's come from Denmark, and she's talking about what is empowerment radio. Then we have our very own Dr. Chege Githiora, who's a chair of the Center of African Studies and also lecturer in Swahili in the Africa Department. He's going to be talking about language and media in Africa. Then we have uh, our very own Carlos Chirinos, who directs SOAS Radio, the radio station that's based here at the School of Oriental and African Studies. And uh, he also teaches radio. He co-teaches uh, a course with me. And uh, he will be talking about SOAS Radio. He'll be talking also about Radio Beyond Borders, an organization that works through student volunteers to promote the use of radio in developing countries. We then have Amy O'Donnell, who is front part of Frontline SMS. She did her MA in Human Rights from, the University, College, from University College London. <clears throat> from University College? At University College of London. And uh, I think some of you may have seen her doing some demonstrations out there, Frontline SMS, which is what she's going to be talking about. I am Lucy Duran. I'm the moderator. Um, I am lecturer in African studies, uh, what am I talking about? I'm lecturer in African music in uh, the music department. I used to be in the Department of African Studies. I am an Africanist at heart. Uh, I also present a weekly program on BBC Radio 3, which is devoted to traditional music. <clears throat> so traditional music on traditional radio. And uh, I will be talking about uh, briefly about that experience, but also about my long encounter with various kinds of community radio in Mali. And then we end with concluding remarks from Linje Magnozo, who is a lecturer at uh, LSE in Media, Communication and Development. And he is going to be talking about his, the topic of his forthcoming book, which is uh, Radio and Development in Africa. But first of all, I would like to welcome up to the podium someone who comes from UNESCO, who, which is, as I said earlier on, is the institution that uh, so rightly has finally appointed uh, a day to celebrate world radio, and today is the day. So uh, please welcome, uh, he's the Director for Freedom of Expression and Media Development at UNESCO. Please welcome Guy Berger. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Lucy, and thanks to Carlos and your team, and thanks to my colleagues at UNESCO in Paris and uh, 30, the 32 officers around the world who are trying to organize this day, this first birth of World Radio Day. Let me start my remarks by telling you I'm a South African, and I'm going to play you a clip from my youth in South Africa. Here we go. I hope it works. Africa's 
Okay, I, I, I don't know if the mic was working, whether you heard that, but it was the opening call sign for Radio Freedom, Voice of the African National Congress, broadcasting from exile into South Africa with a lot of machine gun fire in the background. <laughs> so that Radio Freedom was the voice of the then banned African National Congress, the ANC, which is today the ruling party in South Africa. It was banned and exiled during the apartheid era Radio Freedom was launched clandestinely in June 1963 at the Johannesburg Lilies, Lilies Leaf Farm, which served as the base for the leadership of the underground ANC's military wing, Omkonto Wesizwe. The radio station lasted less than a month before those revolutionaries were arrested and sent to prison with life sentences. This was along with Nelson Mandela in what was known as the Rubonia Trial. Mandela was accused number one. Today, of course, the ANC is the ruling party, having won power in 1994. But going back, after it collapsed in 1963, Radio Freedom took another four years before it could be revived. It was relaunched in exile, and then it operated uh, on shortwave from Zambia. Over the following 15 years, it gained a platform in Tanzania, Ethiopia, Madagascar, and Angola. And at a time when the exiled ANC could not operate legally inside the country, Radio Freedom became the primary way for the ANC to speak to its mass constituency back home. The connections were not just one way. As a scholar, Sakiba Kiba Lehuati, has described in the Journal of African Media Studies, some Radio Freedom listeners, all of whom faced imprisonment if they were caught listening to the station, some of them nevertheless wrote letters to Radio Freedom to a program called Listener's Corner. They used pseudonyms and they addressed the correspondence to external services, Radio Zambia. Some of the letters got through. No email, no SMS in those days, but Radio Freedom still managed to give voice to some of its listeners. Also interesting about this radio station was the experience in many, probably most cases, in regard to the way that listeners would congregate in small groups to tune into the station and discuss its message. In the 1970s, I was one of those bands of listeners who hung on to every word and was moved by every militant song carried on Radio Freedom. The broadcast, as crackly as you would have heard it now, often jammed on some frequencies by the apartheid regime. It confirmed one thing, that the ANC had not been killed or demolished. It was out there, even if it was not visible back home was able to give some strategic direction and inspiration to the liberation of South Africa. And most importantly, that station could provide a truth that was absent from most of the mainstream media available at the time. Now, all this stood in very stark contrast to the state monopoly radio station back then, SABC. My teenage years in South Africa were spent overhearing a program my parents listened to on the English service of SABC. It went out at 5.30 p.m. every day, and it was titled Music in the Blue of Evening <laughs> by Freddie Carlos. <laughs> I'm sure everybody here remembers a program from their youth, a radio program, and I remember this one with its very peaceful piano melodies on these balm, balm, balmy summer eves, and they would precede the news and the subsequent propagandistic editorial comment. There was no television in South Africa at the time. And the way that this Blue of Evening program worked was to help lull the white community into tranquility that all was well with the world, that uh, society was calm and stable, and that the white-oriented news that would follow was a confirmation that the order of things was here to stay. Of course, that was a very far cry from the realities of mass humiliation and, and exploitation of resentful black South Africans, who, by the way, were served with African language stations run by SABC, which romanticized rural tribal life and had no journalists. They had translators who translated from English and Afrikaans into the African languages. Well, SABC's English service and radio freedom were effective in their own ways, 
each was adequate to its diametrically opposed purpose. For me, listening to Radio Freedom as a student, a university student in 1976, the year of the Soweto massacre when more than 800 school-going children were shot dead, Radio Freedom was very liberating. It carried strong voices uncowed by the brutality of apartheid. It was not at all intimidated by white arrogance and power. It showed resistance and defiance. And the station was a major factor in me personally becoming more deeply involved in the struggle, unfortunately, with a few years of political imprisonment that followed in later years. Anyway, I tell this personal story because it highlights not only the power of radio, but also the double-edged sword character of the medium. It shows that there is radio that can insulate and reinforce narrow-mindedness and conversely, that there's radio that can open minds to understand and challenge injustice. There's radio that can divert and distract from toxic realities, and there is radio that can help to change those realities. This spectrum of potentials is one reason that accounts for the, for the successful worldwide spread of radio. Today, more than 75% of households in developing countries have a radio, and for them, this is often their primary or even their exclusive linked to mass communication. In increasing numbers of countries, radio is also the number one medium for offering a choice of channels and languages and interests. In Uganda, there are over 150 stations today. The same goes for the Democratic Republic of the Congo. There are even more in Niger, which was a pioneer of radio pluralism in Africa. Peru has almost 17,000 stations. In Pakistan, 30% of men according to one survey, say that they listen to radio using the receivers built into their cell phones. The point is radio has extensive roots everywhere. Meantime, the digitization of radio transmissions is still a distant prospect in most of the world. That's no matter for most countries where there's still ample space for analog stations. And even as other digital distribution opportunities proliferate, there continues to be an interest in pure audio as a valued form for free expression and mass communication. Radio, in this sense, is not a technology. It's also not even a, a platform. It's a social institution. Long before social networking became vogue, radio was already a social construction which built identities and communities and which created conversations around these. This phenomenon of radio has been a vector for exposure to music and culture and its unique unimodal character has proved to be a very powerful stimulus to the imagination. In short, radio in this holistic sense has been and is a star that, contrary to the song, was never killed by video, nor by any means is it rendered redundant by digital or IP protocols. In fact, it can and does ride upon them and get strengthened by them. This durability of radio is one reason why UNESCO is currently working with CEDA, the Swedish Agency for International uh, Development, on a program to support 37, 34 countries and 34 stations in seven African countries to build capacity there to harness internet and new technologies like cell phones to do better journalism for African audiences. Well, it's also for these reasons regarding radio that UNESCO's 195 member states decided last November to support a Spanish proposal for a special day on the international calendar to pay attention to this medium. So what's the purpose of this day, you may ask? Well, my answer is that it is what you, want to make, what you want to make of it. For many people, it's a time to celebrate the positives around radio. For others, it can be a marvelous opportunity for advocacy, to foster reform in recalcitrant governments, such as Zimbabwe, which is still dragging its feet on freeing the airways for non-governmental non stations. And the day can also be a time to secure more support from public subsidy, from advertisers, or from communities in many other countries. And this is why this World Radio Day is catching on in many places. There are events taking place on this very day in Cuba, Dominican Republic, Uzbekistan, Nepal, Palestine, Mongolia, and Australia, amongst others, including here at SOAS. But let us not assume that this important day will continue to snowball, or even that it will survive. The experience of World Television Day which continues to have limited profile and visibility after many years, is salutary. The question we can profitably ask is, how does a special day come into being organically and in a sustained way? Some lessons can perhaps be drawn from World Press Freedom Day, which is on the 3rd of May. Although it's called press freedom, it refers to media freedom. 
Last year, 100 countries around the world marked World Press Freedom Day. This year, where UNESCO will host a major conference in a free Tunisia, is likely to see even more than 100 countries marking this day. But it's taken a long time to reach this point. It was the 1991 Vinto Conference convened by UNESCO that made the original call for such a date to become internationally observed. The momentum then had to be maintained in order for that proposal to be put to the UN General Assembly, first put to UNESCO member states and be agreed by them, then put to the UN General Assembly and be agreed by that. And then the media industry itself, as well as media NGOs and universities with journalism and media schools, they all needed to take ownership of this occasion and organize their own commemorations. So sustainability can happen, as has been the case with the World Press Freedom Day on the 3rd of May. I don't think that World Radio Day will become as well known as many of the world's religious holidays or Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> but it certainly has the potential to become a self-reproducing and multiplying occasion in the years ahead. For our part at UNESCO, we'll continue, despite very limited budgets, to do what we can to promote this day. Since the UNESCO conference gave rise to this occasion, we've now written to the UN Secretary General to convey the request of the UNESCO member states that the day now be put on the agenda of the UN General Assembly. Getting through that hurdle is essential if the date is to become official internationally, because only the General Assembly can agree on international days. If the momentum of this year continues to build, it will become easier to persuade the General Assembly at the UN, which is skeptical about adding yet more days to the international calendar. But it's possible that they will agree that radio indeed deserves its special moment. Let me conclude with a short anecdote. Until I joined UNESCO last November, I spent 18 years in the small South African town of Grahamstown. This settlement has one of the oldest community radio initiatives in South Africa, and yet Radio Grahamstown has had a very shaky existence, often wrought by politics, always lacking resources. Occasionally, it's been off air. I arrived in the city of Grahamstown in 1994, the year of South Africa's first democratic elections, and I was invited to a meeting to advance the agenda of setting up this station. As had been my instinctive habit, born of experience, I cast my suspicious eye around the attendees at the meeting to try and spot who was the police spy in this, in this <laughs> gathering. My focus alighted on one individual, and I waited with interest as the meeting went round and people identified themselves. Lo, when it came to my suspect, he openly disclosed he was from the police. <laughs> Times were changing. Today, Radio Grahamstown owes its recent survival to a community member who chairs the board who happens to be a policeman in his day job. Other local people who volunteer their time for that station are a preacher who drums up attendance for her church. She uses the station as part of her business model. <laughs> there are also young men who want to be US-style DJs. There are do-gooders wanting to, sp to spread health messages and moral behavior messages. There are musicians who want exposure. And there are also some wannabe journalists who seek to conduct hard-hitting interviews with local officials. It is a vibrant, even if it's not very sustainable, station. It functions and the services are put on air, and that's what's important. Amongst the audience are local teenagers who, despite great poverty and unemployment, still send in instant messages which are cheaper than SMS. And they listen attentively to programs such as Y2Y, Youth to Youth. So Radio Grahamstown is a station that Radio Freedom, which closed in 1991, would have been very pleased to see. At UNESCO, we're very pleased also to see stations like Radio Grahamstown, that they have an opportunity to exist as part of the materialization of freedom of expression, especially in a small town in a developing country. Now, on World Radio Day, we should not forget experiences like SABC English Service Radio that I mentioned, nur of course, the Rwandan Radio Mil Colin the genocidal service, but those kind of services are not about free speech. So on this particular occasion of this day today, let us celebrate the positives. In other words, how radio provides audiences with information and cultural access and choice, and how audiences themselves are, in are increasingly participating in the medium as well. This focus on the positive is why I can happily say to you, happy World Radio Day and wishing you many returns. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Guy Berger.
Well, next we're going to hear from uh, the panel member who's come all the way from Denmark. Uh, she has spent over 30 years working in media development, press freedom, communication for empowerment, and community radio in Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. Just not Latin America, but everywhere else. Uh, she is chair of the Panos London Board, and she leads the work of Empower House. And she is going to be presenting her new book and telling us what is Empowerment Radio. So please welcome to the podium Birgit Jalov. Much, Lucy, and hello to everyone. Uh, I'm really um, happy, pleased, and satisfied to be here with all of you to celebrate the first ever <laughs> World Radio Day. Radio, as we have already heard, is not just a medium, but it is all the things that it can be used for, and all the development, empowerment, dignity, and rights, among others. So let me also repeat the wish of a very happy World Radio Day to everyone. We are meeting today discussing uh, new perspectives on traditional radio. We uh, have, in terms of radio, the radio spectrum, the public service radio, the national uh, uniting voice that uh, is a place where the national dialogue and the, the national identity can be, among others, uh, strengthened, not to forget the professional um, presentation of uh, issues of importance for us. The same at the local level, these types of services I want to stress before I move into my uh, describe, description of uh, community radio uh, are not in any way covered by the community radio spectra. This is a different type of radio that are immensely important, not least at an era where many countries consider privatizing, commercializing the national radio service. We need public service radio. There's commercial radio that I will not go into much depth with, but that is a colorful part of the radio spectrum. But community radio, the voice of the people often called is what I will focus on here. The voice of the girls and the women, of the boys and the men, and the voices that emerge when communities join forces to create a space of discussion and debate about the issues important to them and to their community. Ensuring that wherever we are, we can listen and providing a space for groups to identify the common traits and to uh, address challenges and to move forward towards common visions. Radio is used in many different ways. One often used is to uh, create listening clubs, to meet together with people to actually uh, make a, a, a coordinated use of uh, the programs there. Throughout my life, uh, I have experienced very powerful results when people speak for themselves uh, from very early on, and community radio, I have seen, often generate important, powerful individual and community change. And I have, during all my many years working in this field, been asking questions, been researching, been looking for answers to what is it that actually generates lasting community change? And what is it that distinguishes the failed initiatives from those that take root and keep going? I've worked with identification of impact assessment methodologies and carried out these impact assessment with community groups and worked to distill the elements. This is why for today I'm not just talking about it, I'm actually very pleased to uh, present um, all, of this, uh, all of these many years of uh, research and work and uh, questioning and searching for answers on the many issues that go into making uh, the uniquely important 
uh, empowerment radio in many communities. At the core of this is community ownership. It is uh, the, the important fact that we keep coming back to when looking to all the questions that I have already addressed. It is when, like these two Laotian uh, rice farmers, uh, in the evening at what will become the radio studio, move around the post-its to see what radios do we want, at what time will they be listened to, uh, in what languages do we need this in all of our languages. And um, in my book and in my uh, work, I describe how, this, uh, how important it is that all communities in the community are involved. I describe how the important initial community mapping can lead into uh, a, a systematic and effective community mobilization and organization that will in turn become the core of the community radio organization. And it is when the planning turns into implemented reality and it becomes our radio when, as here on the opening day of that small community radio in the mountains in Laos, the post-its have become permanent uh, elements of a program format prepared by ourselves. In these 10 minutes, it'll, it's limited how much depth I can go into, but uh, what I have done with all these many years of experience and contemplation is to create a system, a step-by-step -step system that I have seen work, um, where you begin with an exploration of the feasibility and the context of operation, continue into building on what you have found out, the things you have to work against and the things that will work with you into the preparation of the framework with the community mobilization. And I want you to look at the third column at the bottom where equipment comes in. One of the things I have found very strongly is that uh, for a community radio to become uh, the kind of empowerment focused radio, it's very important that the equipment only comes in when the community is mobilized, organized, and has its agenda, its vision, and its plans in place. Once the equipment is there, attention is attracted to the power of the microphone. It's lovely if my uh, girlfriend can hear my nice voice and the music I am playing for her. Um, and this is a, a good thing to get into once you move into the establishment phase. You know why you want the radio, you know what you want the radio for, and you know how you will move forward with it. And once it's on air, it's important. There are a series of, of core areas that uh, you can work with in order to keep the radio on air and uh, strengthen the sustainability aspects of it. But calling it empowerment radio, what is this empowerment and what is it it does? You can ask and I will answer. <laughs> uh, I will share with you some impact results from two studies, one in uh, central Mozambique and one in, uh, in Laos. Uh, one radio where I carried out uh, an impact assessment a year after it was on air, um, the people in the, the leadership of, of the community could say with me that it is a changed community. There's increased debate, an increased conviction that it is the people's rights to debate, an empowered um, way of moving around everyone's business and the approach to the community's business, and a number of concrete cases of actual improved livelihood, also in the economic and the day-to-day -day sense. There are a number of issues here, electricity supply, um, the corrupt were questioned and questioned and questioned, and in the end the money that had disappeared from the electricity that should have come two years ago uh, miraculously emerged and the community got its electricity. Um, another strong example is that the community, uh, and rightly so, probably didn't trust the public radios and the authorities' suggestion to use chlorine and water during the annual flooding that brings, as you in this school particularly, 
very well know, uh, cholera. The year after this radio was on air, and it was the familiar voices, those we know and can trust in our radio who gave the same information, there were no cholera deaths. Usually about 200 people died. This continued um, year after year. And there are a number of such important impacts uh, that can be um, researched and through um, uh, a rigorous methodology identified as stemming from the radio. In uh, moving to Asia, in uh, the Shenkwang province in uh, Laos, uh, one year into uh, operation again, did the radio generate impacts? And the answer is yes. Many strong examples. The second you can see is less abusive practices towards women. And I can say that every community radio that I have evaluated or where I've carried out impact assessments, this is one of the first results that women state. We are being beaten up less. For all of the reasons that you know, when the silence is broken, the windows into the families of practices and so on slowly get onto air, uh, practices start to change. Ethnic women who, again, similar to, like to Mozambique, uh, had a good reason to fear that in the vaccine uh, to their children, um, they would be receiving deadly poison. Uh, after the radio came, they, for the first time, brought the children to vaccination because, again, it was the familiar voices who shared this information. Ten minutes? Okay. I look into why, how, what is it that actually creates this, and when is it that it's particularly important that you support uh, these processes, like during election periods. And I have carried out these uh, most of my research in communities that have been far away, remote, vulnerable. And I have seen that at the core of the reason why people follow advice, why the impact of the radios is there, is a trust, confidence, and reliability I refer to. It's a fact that it's the language, not just our language, but the, the dialect of the language spoken in the way we speak, representing our culture, and it is the participation by all communities in the community, effective partnership with people in and around the community, and effective organization, and the fact that it's ours. It's all that that creates uh, empowerment radio. So you can say that all of these elements is a good basis to meet the future. It is, according to my experience, what creates sustainability. And you can say that to the variety of radios I opened up mentioning, I would like to suggest including Empowerment Radio as a special brand of uh, community radio. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Birgit Jalov. Well, next up we have... Uh, the lecturer in Swahili from uh, SOAS's Department of African Studies. I remember meeting him some years ago when he was first recruited to SOAS and being astonished that he spoke absolutely perfect Spanish uh, because, in fact, he did his studies, his uh, doctoral studies in Mexico on African di diasporic communities. Is that right, Chege? <laughs> and uh, so, and one of his publications is uh, a dictionary of uh, Spanish to Swahili. So that's a really wonderful achievement, um, amongst many others, because he's also the director of the Center of African Studies um, here at SOAS. So please now welcome Dr. Chege Githiora. <laughs> Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, <clears throat> once again, I should like to formally welcome you once again to SOAS. Um, the Center of African Studies is very happy to co-sponsor today's event, this event on the world, the first ever World Media Day. And I want to give special thanks also to the director of our SOAS radio, Carlos Chirinos, 
and of course all the panelists and all those who have worked very hard to bring all of us here today together. Um, well, when I was asked to speak very briefly, because I'm no expert in radio, I'm more of an expert in languages, as Lucy has pointed out, I did some of my work in Mexico, and uh, one of my publications is on Afro-Mexicans in addition to the dictionary of Spanish, and so um, that background also will bear into the discussion that I have today. Um, so when I was asked to speak about radio, I had to actually sit back and think a lot, a bit, uh, a lot about what it means and what are the highlights in my life about it that have come about through radio. And I couldn't help thinking way back, uh, about 25 years ago, uh, when I was a young student in Mexico, as was pointed out by Lucy, actually I started out my studies in Mexico and ended up in the United States. Um, I had gone there to study, unfortunately, at the time, there were no Kenyans or people that I could relate to linguistically. So for about two and a half years, I did not actually speak my language, which is Yikuyu, and in addition to Swahili, of course. However, one of the things that had happened by pure accident, before I left Kenya, I had recorded a small 10-minute clip on the national radio, on the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation radio. It was simply a farmer being interviewed about how to grow avocado. And believe it or not, this little clip actually is responsible for my maintaining my sanity <laughs> for a very long time. I'm not sure some of you, if you've ever spent three years without ever speaking in your own language to anyone, and that can be a difficult thing to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to say the least. So from there, I, I give this anecdote because I realized that without this radio clip, my life would have been quite different. And I would listen to it every day after work, every evening after school. I would just rush to my room, or maybe on the weekend, to be honest. You know, not every day. <laughs> you know, close myself in and listen and sever and analyze the whole, converse, the whole interview that this farmer was making. And it was a brilliant thing. It was wonderful to my ears, and it really, really did help keep my sanity. So the radio, my association with the radio, has this very, very personal uh, thing, as I'm sure with everybody else. Now, one of the reasons I had gone to Mexico in a sort of roundabout way uh, was, had to do with um, um, an attempted coup that took place in Kenya in 1982. Well, I was not involved in the coup, but, uh, um, in a sort of roundabout way. But again, the dreadful event, okay, the news, any kind of news about this particular event, which was a very scary event, it was a lot of, well, bad things, but the whole of it was delivered by radio. Without radio, you had no access to knowing what is happening in the rest of Kenya, not even you know, in the rest of the city of Nairobi. So again, Radio, and I'm sure you all agree with me, we all know has a very, very central role in the social life of all of, 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 all of us. Now, here at SOAS, we also do take radio quite seriously, as, as evidenced by the fact that we do have our own radio station. Um, many of our associates uh, in African studies, uh, in, uh, who are doing African studies, are engaged in research in media. And we constantly use the radio either to as a platform to share our experiences, our ideas, or even in production of programs that are later uh, uh, used to educate or to teach or to inform uh, others elsewhere outside of SOAS. We actually do have a Swahili forum, a forum in the Swahili language, and I can see Rob here and others who do participate in Sema Sasa production, which is a regular program in Swahili for the benefit of the London community. I'm, sure, I'm not sure how far we actually reach out in this radio, but at least within London, you can actually enjoy a weekly show uh, in Swahili. Of course, there are other radio stations, community radio stations in London, which also broadcast in different African languages. Many, many different languages are broadcast within London. Now, again, I'm touching very briefly, but in terms of the role of radio, and again, 
I'm not explaining the field, so I can only talk very much about Kenya and some of the experiences I've had in some of those areas. There is no question that in terms of community engagement, radio is fundamental. As I said, even earlier in earlier days, leave alone now in the days of the internet, this was the sole means of even sending greetings across the country. And I remember again in my youth, on Saturdays there was this radio show, I think it was called Use for the Asking, or uh, one of those shows where you could call in. Right, well, in those days actually there were no mobiles, there was not, the phones were not so available, so you would have to write your request, maybe a week in advance or two, send it to the Voice of Kenya, and if you're lucky, your greetings might be sent from one corner of the country to the other, to the people, maybe relatives or friends or others that you want to greet. I remember this was also something of an event, a weekend, something to look forward to every weekend, thanks due to the radio uh, at the time. Now, in, modern, in more recent times, obviously, since the liberalization of the airwaves in the 1990s, the proliferation of radio stations has been tremendous. There, I don't have the exact count of the radio stations uh, in Kenya, but at least those online alone, I just did a quick uh, search on Google and I found about 25 radio stations, Kenyan radio stations, that are online. And so one of the effects of this, again, now is that not only it is reaching the wider Kenyan communities, but of course the diaspora, which is also increasingly um, and considered and seen and understood and valued as an important constituency of many African countries. And therefore, you have Kenyans and other Africans speaking to their communities here in London or in Europe or elsewhere, thanks due to the radio. And so again, this, these are very, very interesting developments that I think We'll, we still have yet to see the full effects of the radio on, Africa, uh, on African uh, communities. Needless to say, I'm very interested in languages, being a linguist myself in, by training. And again, language, the, the, the fact that um, the, the, you, we, can, we can actually broadcast in African language, in different languages of Africa, of Kenya or Africa, on the radio has really spawned another great industry it is not only about the matter of preserving our languages, particularly the endangered ones, which can now be recorded, which can be shared you know, across vast distances. As we all know, one of the principal uh, uh, advantages of the radio is its, the, the length and even the breadth of its reach in a very inexpensive, practically uh, uh, cost-free manner. So all the community radio stations that have been established in Kenya since the 1990s have contributed tremendously in the revival and the preservation of many, many languages. It has spawned a whole industry of, in terms even of economics, we have reporters who would not have been reporters if they had only one radio station broadcasting in English or just in Swahili alone. So you have all these reporters, young people, getting, make, making, you know, getting gainful employment um, by being um, uh, if you want, reporters or agents of the particular different radio stations uh, that uh, speak to their communities. Health, public health, obviously. You know, these are very, very obvious matters which to, uh, the radio contributes very, very heavily in promoting. Talking about you know, awareness campaigns and so on and so forth. A great deal of our people in Kenya and in Africa are not literate. And where they are literate, they often cannot afford to use print media. In Kenya, right now, the newspaper costs about 60, 50 shillings. Okay. 50 shillings, the minimum wage, daily wage recommended is 150 shillings per day. So a newspaper would cost a third of a day's wage. You can imagine if you're going to buy a newspaper or you're going to buy a piece of some food to eat. The radio steps in very, very handily because the news, commentary, entertainment can be obtained practically free of charge through the airwaves. And I think this is a major contribution also in alleviating some of the uh, difficulties that face people on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, um, I th I, I'm sure there's a lot more to talk about and it has been mentioned and I will not dwell on that, but of course we have the negative aspects of radio. As we speak, we do have a Kenyan actually who is in The Hague on trial before having used radio 
to propagate hate messages which led to the post-election violence in Kenya. So obviously we do have um, the negative side of that, of, of this type of uh, thing. Well, um, I will just now end by saying simply that radio, and this is a very important day, the World Radio Day, uh, particularly for us Africans, particularly for those of us who work with uh, marginalized communities, if you want, or marginal communities, uh, where it's not easy to use other, tradition, other media to reach the people. But thanks to the radio, again, and the internet in combination, and I'm sure we shall see more of these type of applications, now I do not have to sit and worry about my sanity as I did 25 years ago. <laughs> Every morning when I wake up, or rather when I get to my office or in my home, I switch on to the Kenyan radio, and if I want to listen in Swahili or in Kikuyu or in English, it's all at my call. So I think radio is wonderful, and I'm very happy to be here today and share with you about the World Radio Day. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Chega Githiora. And of course, the burning question is, did you learn how to grow avocados? Did you learn how to grow avocados? Chege. Sorry? Did you learn how to grow avocados? Sorry, I'm busy trying to get to you. <laughs> no, I'm... Okay. Did you learn how to I'm grow avocados? Yeah. Oh, well, yes. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. He'll tell us about that afterwards. <laughs> Well, next we're going to have the director of SOAS Radio, the man who uh, actually was involved in the founding of SOAS Radio. In those days, it was called Open Air Radio. Um, it originally was an FM station, and now I believe it's an internet radio. Um, together, we teach a course called Presenting World Music on Radio, which is about script writing and presenting skills, but also about learning how to actually use the, uh, the radio station and the radio equipment. Um, these are very transferable skills and it's an important course that was awarded the Director's Teaching Prize, the SOAS Director's Teaching Prize in 2009. So that shows you the kinds of uh, ways that we involve radio in our coursework. So uh, please welcome Carlos Chirinos. Sorry, I, I didn't come here that quick. It's just I'm aware of time, so I want to speak quick. So. That's fine. So, thanks everyone for being here. I, I just, I'm just, you have no idea how, um, how much time and effort we have had to put into bringing all these people together and making sure the room was here and uh, not double booked. Those of you who mm -hmm. come to see us will know about this. So all the things I wanted to talk to you about are three, three things. is education, minority languages, and volunteering. That's one of the reasons why I'm speaking right after Chegi. Um, first of all, education. And that's one of the reasons why we're here. SOAS Radio is here. It's based at the university, a higher education institution. For many reasons, uh, volunteering and extracurricular activities are very important for students at every level. Uh, undergraduate, postgraduate students. Because there is a need for academic and vocational training to come together. And this is one of the examples of the course that we put together, precisely to give the students those skills that they are not learning. In the UK, journalism is the only place where you will learn radio skills, or in fact, radio courses. But outside in the academia, there is not much bridging between academic training and vocational training. And there is also the important role of universities in connecting the local and the global. And this is, using radio is, is, is a very easy way to do this because radio is cheap. We heard Brigitte and we have heard about the advantages of using radio. But in countries like the United States where college radio is actually the most popular network after the commercial network. That tells you a lot about the importance of, of university radio. For example, KCRW in California, which is the most popular radio station by, by popular demand, is set at the Santa Barbara College. 
So that tells you a lot about what we, in terms of education, in higher education, really need to look at uh, um, when we talk about radio. There is also the multilingual radio, which for us is very important. When we started the radio station, we thought pretty much about a small version of the BBC World Service, because the World Service is what, like, yeah, we want to work at the BBC World Service when we get out of here. <laughs> so we, we thought about it in those terms, like, well, since we have one of the largest schools of, of um, non-European languages at SOAS, and there is people here from everywhere that speak other languages, why don't we start producing content in different languages? That way we open up that niche for ourselves. And since then, we have been producing content constantly in Japanese, Mandarin, Arabic, Swahili. I was impressed. I always get impressed with the team uh, of volunteers. On Friday, we made a call. Hey, these people from UNESCO, these friendly people from UNESCO are asking <laughs> us if we can produce some clips in Arabic, Mandarin, French, Portuguese, Spanish. And by Sunday afternoon, we had all of them which was great, not only because of the teamwork of those guys that are out there. Uh, without them, we, haven't, we wouldn't have been able to put the event together, but also the working languages. They went out and found the people, contributors, and just got it done. And there is also the employability agenda, which for our students in these um, turbulent times is a very important thing. And this is another one of the things that we want to do with SOAS Radio, is precisely giving those skills for the students to be able to go out and employ the academic training they got here and use it in something else. Now, some, just some cute photos of the studio. That's Manu Chao in the studio, in our studio upstairs. That's the greatest um, Calestus Juma with Guy Colander, who is in the room. <laughs> now, I wanted to speak to you about radio and development. As part of our work, we have been doing consultancy, advising, um, community radio stations. We started here with the London Huayu Chinese radio, which was the, I think is the first um, Mandarin speaking radio station in London. And from then, I started working with other colleagues around the world. And one of the first ones that we did uh, was a consultancy for Radio Biso Nabiso in the forests of the Sangha region in the Republic of Congo. This was the first community radio station to broadcast in the 12 indigenous languages spoken in the timber concessions in northern Congo Brazzaville. Now, in this case, the radio was used as a tool for resilience to climate change and concerted forest management to bring the communities and the loggers together, which is a very, very difficult uh, task to bring these two together. But we found out that radio was the perfect tool because it could give those minorities the voice that they couldn't get through. And that way they managed to force the logging company to concede and, and make concessions actually to the communities, please. This area is mainly Baca, Bantu, and other communities. Baca are forest people, semi-nomadic communities. Um, Lingala is the official language, but some communities don't speak it around there. So, some pretty photos of Bison Aviso, again. In the field, doing recordings. In the studio. But working for this project, I came to, uh, I found a very difficult issue, which was organizing different languages for a radio station. One of my roles, I didn't get involved in setting up the actual antenna and the studio. I advised more or less what studio, what equipment to get. But then I went to actually try to organize the everyday running of the studio, from the editorial meetings, to putting together an editorial team, to actually organizing <coughs> how we're going to save files, how we're going to label things. And then when we came to the realization that there were 12 indigenous languages, and I know this because we have been organizing content <coughs> in Japanese, which I don't speak, in Mandarin. And I don't speak Mandarin, but we have to organize it. That was the major challenge, is that how we're going to make sure that communities that record something, and there are very small communities that have less than 10,000 speakers and some others that have more than 20. How are we going to make sure that this content is cataloged and labeled 
in the right way. That was one of the main challenges. So that made me think about radio and minority languages. And today, around 7,000 languages are spoken around the world. Most of them are so-called minority languages. They are subordinated to a vernacular language used by the majority of the population. Many of these are endangered because of smaller communities in certain larger nation states often subordinate their own language to secondary use or completely give it up. Mainstream media plays a major role in the process of language loss, but on the other hand, community media can help sustain these languages. And I'm going to run through. There was a case study of Irish language revitalization where two Irish language radio stations were identified as giving strength and supporting the maintenance of the language. Uh, minority language media requires qualified staff who are able to use the language, raising the value of the mother tongue in employability. As a language carrier, media plays a critical role in providing an outlet for language dissemination and archiving. Radio also plays a key role in disseminating information to communities lacking a writing system for the minority language, as newspapers, as Che said, prove useless. And TV, well, has other issues. The challenges in minority language radio are programming, producing quality educational content, and appropriate archiving of recordings. What I said in the practice, that's what, that was the main problem. These are areas open for collaborations between radio stations and the academic sector. And that's one of the areas we sort of want to support. Now volunteering, which is, this is the, how I'm going to finish my presentation. Academic departments at SOAS interested in these areas are the Development Studies Department, the Endangered Languages Department, and many others. SOAS Radio has been a creative, and it is a creative hope for the students to relate to these parts of the world and learn practical skills in a professional environment. And that's why we are launching Radio Beyond Borders. Radio Beyond Borders is an organization that works through student volunteers worldwide to promote the use of radio and other media to promote development and social cohesion. Uh, the idea is to train students in practical aspects of setting up, running a radio station, editorial management, what have you, and work with community radio stations in developing countries to share skills, build capabilities, and promote cultural exchange. So one of the ideas of today, if you are out there and are working in the field, we can have very, very interesting volunteers that can work with you. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos Chirinos. Well, our fifth presenter uh, is someone who you might have met out in front. She uh, joined something called, an initiative called Frontline SMS, the radio project, and she's here to tell us about it. She has uh, a background in, uh, she holds an MA in human rights, as I was saying earlier on, and um, she was project coordinator at the Unrepresented Nations and Peoples Organization based in the Hague, where she supported minority groups and indigenous communities to develop human rights campaigns. So please welcome Amy O'Donnell. Oh, thanks so much, Lucy, for the great introduction. And I really want to say thank you very much to Carlos and Uzma from Lifeline Energy, who have done such a great job pulling this event together. Um, without you, it wouldn't have happened. Um, and I also want to say thank you to all of you for, for joining the event and celebrating World Radio Day, adding radio to the map of events going all the way around the world. So I thought it was really interesting that Guy earlier said that at Radio Freedom people were used to writing letters to contribute to the radio station. Um, but today I'd like to talk about different technologies which are really changing the way that radio is used as a platform for audience engagement. And so I want to bring up this map. And um, it shows the dark areas are where there is not so much electricity prevalence. And we've heard a lot about the ways in which radio can be a powerful tool to reach the most ma marginalised and vulnerable communities. Um, Lifeline Energy produce uh, solar and wind-up radios. They had some in the demo area earlier, where you don't even need an electricity source to access the radio. 
The other reason I brought up this map is really to demonstrate that context is king. So when you're thinking about different technologies as a communication tool to reach people, it's so important to think about lightweight tech, appropriate tech that is already in people's hands. So I'd like to introduce to you another technology which is similar in pervasiveness, ubiquity and accessibility as the radio, and that's the humble mobile phone. So I brought up this graph to demonstrate the rising number of mobile phone subscriptions that we realised that at the end of 2011, there were 5.9 billion mobile subscriptions worldwide. So it really is a, wide world, a, a very accessible and ubiquitous tool. And you can also think of the benefits of shared phones, where an individual may not have a phone themselves, but could be able to share one in, amongst their community. And I recently went to a radio station in the UK, where they called for people to contribute to the programming via Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. But I think there's incredible potential, and I've seen this in a lot of my work with Frontline SMS, in the ways that people who aren't online, who aren't able to access the internet, can contribute to radio pro programming using their very, very basic mobile. And I particularly want to draw attention to SMS. Um, this is a very uh, intimate and agnostic and uh, immediate type of technology. Um, I think someone earlier spoke about instant messaging um, on their mobiles, but perhaps if, you do, if you're not on the internet on your phone, SMS is one way of doing this. And the great thing about SMS, it's the only platform agnostic <coughs> app. So whether you've got a phone like this or an iPhone, it's a message which you can send amongst lots of people. So this leads me to introduce Frontline SMS. Frontline SMS was developed in 2005. Um, it's been downloaded over 20,000 times and is used in over 70 countries. It's a completely free, so why not go and download it now? It's completely free, open source as well, so if you're a developer, you can have a play with the code. And uh, the idea is that you have this on your computer, and from that moment on, there is no need for you to have access to the internet. You plug in your mobile phone or a modem, and the software acts like an interface, almost like an email interface, allowing you to send and receive messages with large groups of people, as well as have a very uh, effective way of managing these text messages. Um, it can do some funky things. Uh, we can auto-reply re to messages, so if you want to have people uh, requesting specific types of information, like market price information, you can send them a text message in reply based on the keyword, auto-forward it to someone who's on the move, the great thing about it is managing groups and contacts, and there's a way to set up within the system where people can auto-subscribe themselves to groups, texting stop if they don't want to receive messages anymore. And if you are connected to the internet, there's also some things like you can have SMS be posted up to Twitter or Facebook using a HTTP trigger without the people using these basic phones on the ground needing to have access at all. Um, and there's some great things it does with data collection and data visualisation as well. So in particular, um, I want to kind of bring this back down to the ground here and say, well, what's the relevance for World Radio Day? Well, the great thing is that we've heard about lots of radio stations using text messaging to interact with their audiences. While radio is a very one-way broadcast, by introducing text messaging, it's a very, very powerful way to promote participation and interaction. Um, listeners are able to generate and guide content themselves, and it also promotes very local content stimulating dialogue as people are able to interact with the programming that they hear on their radio. Uh, radio stations are increasingly relying on their audiences to be their eyes and ears, like citizen journalists, where radio stations will ask them for news tips and then be able to send journalists to the ground to report from where they think that, that the events are occurring. And most importantly, let's think about the ways in which audiences are able to have a voice in those important discussions which are affecting them. Um, and so this is a very sector-specific application of Frontline SMS where we're actually coming together to customise the software for this purpose. So the timing of World Radio Day couldn't be more perfect. I had a dance around my office when I first saw this because it's the new version of Frontline SMS Radio. You're very lucky, ladies and gents, not many people have seen it. Um, it's in alpha trial at the moment with some radio stations. Uh, one station in northern Kenya has received 16,000 messages in just three months. And we've got some great things like uh, shows. I'm happy to talk with anyone who's interested in the details of the functionality. Um, and this is almost pro promoting a Twitter-like way that people can use SMS to interact with the discussions which they're hearing over the radio. 
An important challenge for us has been the ways in which uh, discussions are, are interpreted while, while DJs are live on air. So this is just a very simple graph where by setting up a keyword, I was talking to someone earlier who thought a poll on water, by having a keyword set up within the system, you could get people to send a reply about how much water they receive. Texting that keyword, the poll can be automatically generated and all of those people can feel that they are contributing to something which can be announced live on air. I mean, we've heard a lot about voice calls and the ways in which people interact using their voice via the radio. And I think it's extremely powerful, particularly what Carlos was saying about endangered languages. But the, the, the challenge being that airtime is naturally a commodity and you can maybe only get three or four people actually calling into a radio show. So the benefit of SMS is that you can actually reach out to as many people as you like and there's virtually no limit on the number of people who can contribute because SMS is digital and asynchronous. Um, and then just a final thing I want to show you is this contact record um, in the new software where I, I'd consider that uh, for radio stations, the holy grail of what they do perhaps is gathering longitud longitudinal information about who interacts with their radio show. That way they can look at the popularity of different shows, what people are talking about, and build, really build up a profile of the type of people that they're interacting with. So using this software, you can actually um, add custom fields, perhaps a location or perhaps an interest, um, so that you can actually track what people are and, and prove uh, what people are talking about and what they're interested in. Fantastic for proving to donors or perhaps uh, sensibly tapping into revenue streams, um, which is important if you're working in a kind of low resource context. Um, so I'm really conscious of the time because I want you to all have a chance to um, chip in. Um, but I am standing here on behalf of lots of other techies in the room. Um, so airtime uh, were earlier Daniel was out there uh, demoing his software. This is a radio automation system. It's completely free and open source as well, and it's a way that you can actually organize a radio station from almost anywhere. Incredible potential, so ask Daniel um, if you're interested in that. And also Lifeline Energy. I think we've heard a lot about the power of the radio, but let's not forget those who can't necessarily access it. And, and Lifeline do incredible work um, bringing wind-up and solar-powered radios to the most vulnerable and marginalised communities and particularly focus on listener groups so that the dialogue can continue on. Um, and this is my final slide just to explain that Frontline SMS really is a tool which is designed to put ownership into the people who most understand the context in which they operate so that it's through their own creativity and ingenuity that they become empowered. And so on my badge you can see... Our logo is a textable logo of someone raising their arms like so as they become empowered. So I hope um, you are somehow would love to uh, download the software. And if anyone is interested in taking part in the alpha trial, I'd be delighted to hear from you. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Amy O'Donnell. Uh, now it's my turn to just say something very briefly. I'll try to introduce myself a little bit better than I did at the beginning. Uh, I'm lecturer in African music at, uh, in the music department here at SOAS, but I also wear several other hats. Uh, I've produced many albums, particularly by um, Malian musicians. I've been working in Mali with music, doing research and uh, producing music for over 25 years now. And in addition to that, I present a weekly program on BBC Radio 3, which is now in its 12th year, and it's called World Roots. Will you just um, give me one second? So I just wanted to say a few uh, brief things about World Roots before I go on very, very briefly to talk about radio in Mali. Well, public radio, public service radio, uh, who was it that was talking about that? B Birgit was talking about that. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm very lucky to present one of the very few programs that's um, broadcast around the nation uh, and that's, to, that's devoted to world music, particularly the more roots side of world music, this program called World Roots. And in that program, we invite 
musicians to come into the studio and do sessions. But more importantly and more uniquely, we go around the world and record programs on location. And uh, this has been an incredible resource for us um, and for, I think, for students and for many other people. We have probably about um, 100,000 listeners who listen as the program is broadcast, and we probably have uh, something like 50,000 who listen on internet around the world. And the people who listen are, it's a diverse community, but they're people who are lovers of music, uh, lovers of world music, people who um, love to travel, people who uh, have been to some of the countries that we visit, um, people who are curious about how life might be expressed through music in other parts of the world. Um, and then these programs also get um, re-edited and uh, broadcast on the world service. So that's all wonderful, but it's a very different kind of radio, of course, from the sort of radio that uh, one finds in Mali. And so that's what I want to talk about briefly. Um, wait a minute, how do I do this? Just there. Oh, that one, sorry. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to start by um, this very quick whip around some community and, some, and the national radio station in Mali with this. Uh, at uh, the time of Mali's cinquantenaire, the 50th anniversary of its independence last year in 2010, this was the billboard that um, symbolized Mali's independence. And what you see here is a sign that says, Notre Mali, our Mali. And then in Bamanang Kang, which is the uh, main language, it says, Mali has become our own. Uh, Mali kera auntaye. And the person on this, um, on this billboard is, this is a photograph of the late great musician, Grio Bazumana Sisoko, who died in 1987. And here you see him recording for Radio Mali in 1960. So that was the year of independence. And so this musician has survived, his music has survived 50 years. It survived two dictatorships. It survived four presidents. Well, we're now in the reign of the fourth president, his final, last final couple of months. Uh, he re this musician remains the symbol of Mali's independence. Um, and I think that's uh, the, the fact that this particular image of him recording for Mali national radio, this is Mali's expression of its own independence. I think that says a lot about the role of music and the role of Mali's radio. So one of the things that is uh, very striking as you go around Mali is the extremely important role that community radio Plays. Here we have in Segu, in the uh, central part of Mali, a radio station which has resonances, its title has resonances with everything that's been said before about empowerment and so on. The radio of those without a voice, des sans voix. And it's also called Radio Kaira. Kaira means peace. Now, it's an FM station. Actually, this is one of the better equipped um, uh, stations uh, although you can see the equipment is very, very old, uh, but it has a, a cubicle and a separate, separate place for musicians, which is um, what not all radio stations in Mali have that. And here you see uh, the uh, logos on the outside uh, to uh, the diff it combat the, the diffusion of ideas um, and um, principles uh, against intolerance against racism, against exclusion, and against xenophobia, and then to open the antenna to, ex to positive cultural expressions. For anyone who knows Malian music, they'll see that that is the great Ngoni player, Baseku Kuyate, standing in front of the station. He had just been interviewed there in Segu. Then we go up to the northwest of Mali to uh, a small town called Maina. Um, access is only by rail or by a very poor quality dirt road. This is the street where the little radio station is on. And here it is, Radio Gimbaya in Maina, with this uh, 
lovely painting of a woman talking into the microphone. And many, many of the community radios are, in fact, voices for the, those who are without a voice are very often women. So this is a, this is a tiny little radio station which broadcasts to the community, and women play a very important role um, as broadcasters and presenters, and they discuss issues around health, uh, they discuss cooking, um, they discuss childbirth uh, and uh, hygiene and many other things like that. And so, again, further up, you in Kai, the uh, largest town in the northwest, uh, this is uh, the Senegal River, and if you go down there where you see people washing their clothes, bathing, and cleaning their cars, you can see that one of the great things about this particular strip um, by the river is that the cars, as they're being washed, are blasting out from Radio Rural, Radio Rural Kai, which you can see here, Radio Rural Kai. And they have uh, what they specialize in, which is interesting uh, that so many... Uh, communal radio stations have this in Mali, is they really have an extraordinary archive of old regional recordings. So you can hear recordings going back to the early 1960s. Um, some of them are preserved on vinyl, which are in very bad condition, but there they are. So there's a real sense of the importance of archive, even if they don't have the means to preserve it properly. This is outside the station, the little ghetto blaster. And finally, I just want to mention um, one particular initiative that I became involved in, in Bamako. Here we see the Niger River from the escarpment, just to situate you. Um, and there's the so-called old bridge over the Niger River. Well, in Bamako, the, there's a very vibrant culture of wedding parties, which are dominated by women. They're organized by women, the audiences are women, and the main singers, the stars, are women, and there's a whole culture around these wedding parties. And what's uh, been interesting for me is, has been the involvement of this radio station, which is called Radio Guintan, which is La Voix des Femmes, the voice of women. And it, a, lot of, a large part of its broadcasts are actually dedicated to the music of these wedding parties. So they this is inside the station. The resources are minimal. All of these stations are real labors of love, as is community radio in general, hence the emphasis on the word volunteer. Um, but here is the, the uh, most popular presenter on Radio Gintan. He's called Draman Dibo, um, and he is he's recording here. He's recording at a wedding party on the Ghetto Blaster. Um, and then he puts it out on Radio Gintan, and this is his prize, special promotion of uh, the woman of his radio station, Radio Gintan. He won the, the, the prize for the quality of his work. So that's just um, a little idea of how community radio works. To give uh, a platform for music which isn't necessarily otherwise heard, to give a platform to the archive, to let women have a voice, uh, to let lots of people have a voice, um, and to be listened to all around the country by people who otherwise don't have access to the media. Thank you very much. And now, finally, to summarize, uh, I would like to invite uh, someone who is, has uh, a long involvement with uh, radio and communication and its connections with development in Africa in particular. And he uh, has a forthcoming book on radio and development in Africa. And he is a lecturer at, the, at LSE. So please welcome Linje Magnozo. a very lucky man. Um, I have received very few gifts in life.
But one of my very first gifts was a radio, a huge supersonic radio. Very ugly, but my father gave me when I was a little boy. I'm still fascinated by the memories of walking rubbish dumps of the middle class families in the estates where I grew up looking for used batteries, which I would collect and they tie them together using two long sticks in order to power my supersonic radio. We were still a dictatorship under a ruthless totalitarian regime and so too some countries in the Southern African region. The president, Dr. Hastings Gamzubanda, did not allow his citizens to have access to television. He said it would corrupt our morals, let alone alternative newspapers, save for very few publications whose operations were heavily controlled by the ruling Politburo. I still remember the wonderful evenings when after supper, that is if we had managed to have food that night, we would sit in the dark and tune in to the shortwave Chinyanja services in Zambia or Johannesburg. We would listen to the broadcasters telling us of how oppressive our government was, something I must be honest, most of us never realized. We would also learn of the pressures that the international community were putting on the regime to allow for multi-party democracy. Nowadays, when I visit my mother in Cholo, on the estates, she's no longer interested in listening to radio because I bought her television. <laughs> and television is a huge elephant in this room because I believe, after the research that I've done in Africa over the years, that if radio is facing any challenge in Africa, it's from television. When my parents went to bed, I would continue to shuffle through stations looking for shortwave service of the BBC in order to improve my English. Since it was dark, and I was not sure with regards to the specific frequency, I would just shuffle the stations, sometimes past the very BBC I was looking for, listen a little bit to an American broadcast on Africa, and then move on to other stations. And then from the other room, my dad would shout, you cannot listen to all those stations at once. You must choose one. <laughs> so in short, BBC World Service also provided much deeper analysis of the situation in Southern Africa. <coughs> I learned that my country, Malawi, alongside the apartheid government in South Africa, were support, was supporting the Renamo rebels in Mozambique. I also learned of the expensive shopping trips that the president and his regime and I took every year, every year here in the UK. In the morning, I felt much more empowered because I had lots of information that I believed no one had. You remember the movie, The Invention of a Lie? There is this main character who thinks he has information from the man in the sky. Well, I didn't have information from the man in the sky. I had information from the BBC and the Shinyanja services in Lusaka and Johannesburg. I would retell these stories to my friends and family, even though my mother warned I should be careful of being in trouble. As I retold such radio news, I added my own imaginations and fantasies. <laughs> so from these humble beginnings in Malawi, to, to, to London here, where I'm teaching, I have been privileged, I should say, to be involved in a number of research projects that examine the role of radio in society. Radio, as one of the oldest mediums of communications, has its opportunities and threats. In fact, I've just finished carrying out a study on the implication of ICTs in community broadcasting on the African continent. That's in Mali, Mozambique, and Uganda. Mary Myers, who is in the field here, who is um, in the audience here, was one of our you know, supervisors on this wonderful project. And I've been privileged, I must say, to interact with her once in a while on issues related to radio and development on the continent. So from these di different contexts where we come from, what is the story of radio that we should share with each other today? Well, to summarize what my colleagues here have already said, we may think of three issues. Numero uno, number one, is that for many countries who have been marginalized by the imperialism of global capital, and have no access to electricity, telephones, internet, or social media platforms, radio is the most readily available, expansive, 
pervasive, affordable, immediately an immediate and extensive instrument for information and knowledge exchange. The wonderful American scholar Robert Hilliard observes in the book A Century of American Broadcasting that in the early days of broadcasting in the US, the harm radio networks provided what he terms life-saving information to rural and farming communities on weather, market prices, and of course, market opportunities. Like in the US, radio has been so crucial in providing such life-saving information to many rural communities in the global south. After independence in the 1950s and 60s, many countries in Africa and Asia launched agrarian revolution campaigns in which radio was employed to improve communication flows between agricultural researchers and farmers on the ground. In these campaigns, farm radio clubs were used to educate and inform farmers on best bait practices. The same ap approaches apply to health and other, other social development messages. The second issue we can think of emerging from the discussions with the, uh, by my colleagues here is that participatory communication approaches have enabled the improvement of communication and engagement between communities and their service providers using radio. New innovative methods, such as those being pioneered and tested by frontline SMS radio, are empowering farming communities to interrogate the content of agriculture policies and education aimed at their own constituents. The research that I've completed in Africa does show that despite the fact that telecommunication services are still exorbitant, internet-mediated radio has indeed allowed the so-called end users of development communication to become information producers. The Radio Listening Club projects in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, where some of them are known as Las um, Radiophonicas Escuelas, has or have provided a platform for out-of-school education in the communities through eradicating illiteracy on and about social issues. Guy Baker talked here about radio offering an opportunity to stimulate imagination. Finally, or thirdly, radio continues to enable people to go to war against dominant development, economic, and political discourses. In his book, A Dying, Colon a Dying Colonialism, the postcolonial thinker Franz Fanon presented a chapter called, you know, on voice of free fighting Algeria, in which he examined the practices that rebel soldiers use in order to jam French signals to talk about their experiences of what was going on in the country. Fanon observes that listening to these broadcasts, believing them, and then retelling them to others who did not listen to them constituted an act of war. Likewise, in many of our societies here in the West and much of the Global South, there are various forms of such bottom-up radio that allow people to develop and share what the British Marxist historian um, E.P. Thompson described as history from below, i.e. radio allows communities to challenge the single stories that are propounded by dominant discourses. In Africa, Asia, and Latin America, community radio stations are opening up these opportunities for groups to exercise their communication citizenship by having the opportunity to dream and imagine the world on their own terms, by engaging citizens in what the late Brazilian educator Paulo Freire described as conscientization. As such, such radio enables people to speak and unspeak their world. That is to conduct a critical examination of the challenges they face, and of course, to intervene as a way of improving such conditions. Bridget Jalov here talked about empowerment radio and how it allows people to really <coughs> empower themselves as well as to actually dream and imagine as well as implement policies from below. Nevertheless, we should not lose oversight or sight of the fact that radio faces huge challenges. Number one is that, you know, for community broadcasters in many parts of the world, they are not well funded, and sustainability is a huge issue. We're not just talking about financial sustainability. We're also talking about, as Bridget, uh, Bridget talks in her book, social sustainability, institutional sustainability. The second challenge that we should think about is 
the challenge of ICTs and how ICTs are challenging the way we understand radio itself and the way radio operates everywhere. As I said, my mother who, just like me, used to sit down and listen to radio is no longer fascinated by the idea of sitting down and listening to radio. She can access to radios or radio stations through her cell phone. So how, is, you know, how are ICTs changing the way we think about radio? Television is another challenge to um, radio broadcasting. And how, and television as well, sorry, television as well is challenging um, issues related to listenership because people are no longer interested in just listening to radio, but they're fascinated by the idea of watching television and not just watching television, but even the programs that are available through uh, DVDs. In fact, my mother just mentioned to me that next time I visit home, I should bring her Rihanna or Beyonce. I can't imagine. <laughs> and the last issue that I want us to think about in terms of challenges is to think about listenership. Who listens to radio? Because all the time we are talking about speaking, using radio. Who is listening to all these radio broadcasts that we are always talking about? What kind of research methodologies should we employ in order to actually make sense of, understand the kind of listenership that is going on on the ground? So whilst we're thinking about these challenges, let's also think about two issues that have been mentioned in relation to these challenges. The training of broadcasters, not just here in the West, but even out there in the Global South. Guy Berger here has worked so hard to have a, a training institution at Rhodes University where a lot of broadcasters in the region are being trained. But not everybody can afford to go to Rhodes University in Grahamstown to be trained in radio broadcasting. Mary Myers has worked a lot in terms of providing workshops where you know, broadcasters um, have actually had the opportunity to have their capacity built. So what kind of training can be offered outside the university that allows broadcasters to dig deep and allow the aspirations and the dreams and fantasies of people to come out? And lastly, that I would like us to think about is donor funding in radio initiatives. There is a lot of donor funding by Farm Radio International, IDRC, maybe BBC World Service Trust, into radio operations in Africa. And we're talking about, we're always concerned about Western interference on the continent. What happens if such donor funding ceases at a particular point in time? Are we no longer going to have community radios? Are we no longer going to have development broadcasters traveling into communities to create stories that make sense with the people? So I'm hoping that our conversations are going to think deeply beyond the stations, to think about radio broadcasting not just as a set of institutions or structures that have been set up somewhere, but also as a set of practices undertaken by both broadcasters and communities as we seek to make the world a better place so that one day we may all be equal. Thank you.